one of the nice things about the group that we're kicking this off with this morning is that they range on a couple of different spectrums. They, the, the, seri the experiences include state, local, and federal government, and also experiences inside and outside of government. And I thought before we start hearing from them, I wanted to hear from you for a second and just wondered if you've worked, if you've received a government paycheck, can you raise your hand if you've worked for government before? And if you've worked in government for more than one year, can you keep your hand up? Great. I, I, that's something we, we want, as we, we talked a little bit, as I've looked at, and actually over the years talked with some of you, um, is, is this notion of how much we really, in the open government movement, has largely been an outsider movement, at least initially, right? It's been driven by people saying, hey, how do we make government more serviceable to our needs as citizens, in part? How important and, and, and what, how successful have we been at being attuned to and responding to the realities of what it is to do open government inside of a government? And Kathy, I think I'd start with you since you're the active government representative at the table. And I, I guess I should read, say a little bit more about, about Kathy. She's, the, um, she's with the US GSA, the General Services Administration. I'm going to try to go low on the jargon today and abbreviations. Um, and manages their Office of Citizen Services and Innovative Technologies. Okay. Thank you all for coming. It should be a great discussion. So, you know, I think one of the things that's interesting about open government is when it started, you know, say six years ago, it was really driven by, in some respects, citizen demand for transparency and accountability. And folks, including many, many of you all at this uh, podium, we're very focused on trying to make government more open and more accountable to the citizens that we've served. And in the years since, there's, there's been the shift where while transparency and accountability remain really important objectives of open government, what we've seen is that open government also has tremendous social impact down to the community level and also drives economic growth. And so the drivers for open government have really expanded over the years in a way that I think makes it more relevant to most people. Waldo, what, what have you said? So I, I'll introduce Waldo as, um, I'll lead, lead the sentence with saying he's a previous Night News Challenge winner and, and runs the, the, um, the, the US Open Data Institute, which Knight also supports. Waldo, what have you seen work? You've spent a lot of time on the road. You spend a lot of time in conversations with people inside of government. On that economic growth element that Kathy raised, what, what works? So uh, what, what doesn't work? Uh, frequently That's not what I I'll, asked. I'll <laughs> I, I, I'm working my way around to it. That's well, my question. Look at both sides of the coin. So, so um, what, what doesn't really seem to move the, the needle, particularly in state and local government, uh, for long is this notion that uh, open government, and more specifically to my, my work, open government data, should really re be released because it has economic value. Uh, and the reason is because it's really hard to quantify that economic value of any one data set or for any one program. And so how do you come back a year later and say, let's keep doing this and we can prove we should keep doing this because what? Uh, there's almost nothing to point to except like somebody made some apps, which is really weak sauce. Like that's, that is not an argument to keep anything going because those apps are basically always horrible. Uh, so, but what, what does seem to work much better is instead looking at the internal value of when we have opened up our data and when we have made public what we do, how has that benefited us? Because quite frequently, those governments are really bad at sharing data internally. Uh, people who work in government know that often if you need data, you walk down the hall and you knock on the door of the person who has the data and they give it to you on a memory stick or they email it to you, or it's in like some godforsaken L drive on the server where like, you just have to like, plumb your way to the terrible directory hierarchy. Like, oh, didn't you know it's like three levels deep in the folder labeled dragons? That's, <laughs> that's where we keep data about the sewer system. Is that not obvious? Uh, but th that's, that's often how data actually exists within government. Uh, and so when government can start using the data that they open up, so they have a source of their own data, so they can go to their own data repository to find their data, then it's much easier to make an argument for the value of that. 
look, it turns out that we can use our own data and it saves us a lot of time and a lot of aggravation. And also other parts of government who used to come to us and ask us for this data, they don't ask us for that anymore because they can just get it off our website. It saves us time, it saves them time, everybody's happier. Yeah, although, you know, Waldo, I think one of the things that we've seen, at least at the federal level, so, you know, full disclosure, my office runs data.gov, so I do have somewhat of a vested interest in government data. But I think one of the things that we find is that as agencies release the data, the owners of those, that data, even those have been, who've been very okay. sort of protective of it, are delighted when they find that, lo and behold, there are scientists, there are academics, there are entrepreneurs, there are others who can do things with it that, frankly, they had not anticipated. And so while, um, while I agree with you, it has often been the case that people don't see the intrinsic value, sometimes it's because they own it. Of course they don't see it. You need, you need the imagination and the creativity and the linkages between different levels of government and different agencies with government to figure out what are the cool things that you could do if you combine data from census, labor, and say HUD. You know, and then none of those stakeholders, they're too close to it. They might not see those linkages. And, and when it does happen, you're right, there's, there's a, I think delight is probably the word. Like there's genuine delight in the person who's been in charge of this data for like 15 years. Mm -hmm. When they see somebody doing something really novel with it. Now, whether that can translate to making that, you know, sustainably continuing to provide that data, I'm not sure. But there's something to be said for being delighted, which not many people actually get to be very much uh, over the course of their profession. <laughs> Surprised and delighted. Yeah. Surprised and yeah. delighted. Um, so a Andrew, Andrew Hopkins is the CEO of New Civic, and, and one of his hats before, well, one of his hats was working at NASA, which is who I want to tap into, but was being the CIO for the New York State Senate. And I wonder, with this emphasis on delight, you know, when you walked in as the CEO of the New York State Senate, I'm guessing delightful wasn't the initial experience you had when it came to <laughs> releasing data, and you put up some big wins. What was the... What were some of the, you know, what was the nightmares that you had when you first walked in there, and how did you address them? So there is no delight among any New Yorker about the New York State Senate, for sure. That may, <laughs> that may, that may persist to this day. But um, we did put up some big wins in terms of actually getting data out. And the reason we did that is because we had a political mandate, and that was a great forcing factor uh, for us to, to get data out. You know, we had uh, new Democratic leadership elected for the first time in 43 years in 2009, and so they came in with the mandate for change. And whether you think they changed anything or not, they certainly wanted to be perceived as having created that change. So we put how much I was paid online. We put uh, every you know, dollar that the Senate spent online. We opened up uh, bills to public comment online before they were voted on. We live streamed all public hearings, all that, all that good stuff. Um, and I think the, uh, the, the win out of that really was um, that the internal staff and the senators realized that people actually did care. Because when we put this out and asked for input, suddenly senators were getting hundreds of comments on bills, not from the people that they already knew that already showed up in the lobby with their wingtip shoes, which was literally how a lot of uh, lobbying happens in Albany. And they realized there is a larger audience for these issues um, above and beyond their traditional sort of workflows of interacting with people. And I think that my take home from that was that a lot of senators that you may like or, or not like actually do care about serving their constituents in the best way that they really can. And they have a scaling problem without the technology to be able to aggregate opinion and interact with 400, 500,000 people efficiently as one human being. They're sort of inherently relegated to paying attention to people that have a big soapbox as a local organizer, what have you, or a big checkbook, right? And so I think we can, by opening up information, as long as that information can then be augmented and contributed back to by the people it's being opened up to and aug augmented, really, um, I think we have a chance to solve a scaling problem in government where there's a few of us inside government. There's a lot of people that we want to represent and serve. We can do it better by using the data about opinion, the data about actually what's going on, and having a two-way street conversation about that. So I, I, I want to yeah. mention something that uh, I spent a few years, uh, I've spent a few years since I've done it, but reviewing and getting to know every legislative website, every state level legislator's website in the country. Waldo has, uh, how should we say, uh, exotic interests. That was actually a hobby. Like, like, actually, that was yeah. a hobby. Uh, and I have to say, there was every, and it's, maybe things have changed over the past couple of years, there was every legislature's website, and then there was the New York Senate's. There was nothing mm -hmm. close, nothing vaguely in the neighborhood of quality and beauty 
and functionality that the New York Senate uh, site had. It was just incomparable. And my guess is that hasn't changed. Most state legislature websites are still pretty bad. But Seamus, Open Gov Foundation, as I recall, grew out of your experiences in another legislative body, your pain points and frustrations within a with, within Congress. Uh, I don't know how much you talk about that publicly, but if you want to, now's the chance to be transparent. And I'm curious to know, you know, as you look back at what led into Open Gov Foundation, what are your signals that you're looking for that you're making that you're having impacting change on other legislative bodies? Well, you're absolutely right. We grew out of the U.S. Congress, and we grew out of an incredibly messy political fight. It was a fight to keep the internet open and uncensored otherwise known as the SOPA PIPA wars from a few years ago, our first product, Madison, we built as, our, as ourselves, as staffers within the, the US Congress to solve the headaches that we had. Um, we had phones flying, tweets flying, all of this input trying to get in, and the US House of Representatives did not give us the technology to simply do our jobs, to listen, to serve the needs of our constituents, um, so we built it ourselves. And that required a massive shift in culture internally within our own environment on a committee. And from there grew the Open Gov Foundation. I mean, I'm a living example of this inside, outside equals success culture shift in all of this. And I think that on top of that, really, the politics do matter. Talking about the State of the Union, what is the next big thing? Uh, Mayor Kasim Reed from Atlanta um, is one of, one of America's leaders on these issues. And he instructed us as open data, open government folks to start every conversation with what I'm about to tell you, Mr. Government, is not going to get you beat in your next election, <laughs> right? And I, it blew my mind. But right there, that took a massive step towards those government users for them to be open to take the risk to do something better with us outside of government. I think that's really important and something that's not talked about enough. So I, I should say that as we're going live today, we're, we're announcing a grant to OpenGov Foundation from Knight Thank Foundation you. because we've just been really excited by the progress they've been making. So now that the grant's done and the paperwork's done, <laughs> what's been your biggest failure in the last few years since you have <laughs> what's, Now you can tell me the truth because the check's in the mail. What's been my biggest failure? Well, uh, should have asked for more money. Should have asked for more money. <laughs> Clay Johnson, if you're out there, actually he told me that was my biggest failure the first time. Um, you didn't ask for enough money. No, thank you. Um, and the Knight Foundation and the whole team and many people in this room, Jen Palka, I see you, David Moore, I see you, Waldo, I see you, have gotten us to this point, not just through, through support, although that helps. Um, but You're buying yourself time for the biggest failure. But through, but, but through software. And I think one of the things, the biggest failure was we tried to go with Madison and with the State Dakota that Waldo started to a place without being sensitive to the political culture of it. Uh, it was the state of Maryland. Uh, we came in with, go, we're going to change this, we're going to touch your legislative process, we're going to open up your legislative data. All of the incentives that we talked about uh, were for folks outside of government. When the people who produce this information, who ultimately hold the keys to the kingdom, I was not giving them articulate, easy to understand incentives for releasing this information in an open format so that we could do all this fun stuff, which we're all very versant in, that the open government civic engagement world likes to do. And I think it, it, it is that cultural point. Our biggest failure when we started was not understanding and taking the time to understand the unique culture of that place. So, Kathy, you came into government from the private sector. Mm -hmm. As you've been a leader in this movement, what have been the cultural sensitivities that you've had to develop inside of government, and what have been the ones you've just tried to knock down and just said, get over yourselves? <laughs> so, so right now we're in the midst of, of really trying to ignite a, a cultural revolution, if, if you could say it that way. And, and I think the biggest change has been that people in government are very, very tempted to develop systems and services based on budget, schedule, and a procurement process that's pretty rigid and sequential and plan-based. And what we're trying to do is culturally change that. So instead of designing and developing services and systems from the inside out, we're trying to, to drive towards developing things from the outside in with a citizen-centric focus. And so we've stood up a new organization that you'll hear about a little bit later called 18F, the Presidential Innovation Fellows Program, which Jen was affiliated with during her time in government. 
has put 27 amazing innovators out in agencies working on projects. And while the number of people that we have is small relative to the size of government, and the number of projects that we'll touch is small, what we're really trying to do is be a catalyst for change and try to help bring into government a citizen-centered, user-centered, open and agile way of working that will help be good medicine against this temptation to always start with budget and schedule. And as maybe for all, this is for all of you, has healthcare.gov been a boon or harmed your efforts in that realm? I mean, I would say the, it's The better. act of healthcare.gov and the, the reactions to it. I think it's been an incredible teachable moment. And I know that is a somewhat overused phrase. Um, but I, I think it was actually Clay and Harper Reed who wrote a, a fantastic op-ed that I encourage everybody here to read after that fact, trying to understand what really happened there so that we can do it better the next time. And it, what I read in that situation, again, was that it wasn't necessarily the technology itself. It was the culture behind the development of the technology where the problem lies. And a lot of what I think we stand for is bringing in people and bodies and enthusiasm to change that culture over time so that stuff like that just simply never happens again. Yeah, and you know, I, I would agree with that. I think for us, we've had a, we, we have a number of platforms and communities and services that we provide to agencies at no charge to help be a catalyst towards digital government. And I think what we found is that the interest and the awareness of how important things like usability are has really been heightened. And in the past, where people thought, well, it's a policy, you, you just throw together a website, you get it out there, it works. You know, very, it was a very good reminder that usability really matters and designing things for the users who need to, to take advantage of the functionality is really critical to success. So we've got a digital analytics program that we've been providing to agencies. We've got 3,500 uh, websites across government using Google Analytics to really look at their performance of their websites and look at where are people going and what are they doing. Um, we also, we combine that, we also have a government search tool that's on um, about 1,500 sites. And so we've got about one point, it's a lot of numbers, but we've got about 1.2 billion page views a month that give us insight across government into the performance of government websites. I think healthcare.gov pointed out, why, why does that matter? Why do we need to know how effectively the services that we're developing, uh, that we're delivering to our systems, how do we know if they're working and what citizens want? I think another, that's, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, another part of that story, I think though, is not just, you know, the, the stumbles out of the gate in terms of the, the software and the site, but ultimately, you know, really making, making, the, making the quota, making the target, a lot of that, as I understand it, um, wasn't directly involved, but I've heard secondhand was about, you know, good old, you know, email marketing and outreach and, you know, very explicit effort to get word out and to get people to come, even if they'd heard bad things about the site and ultimately to have a successful experience signing up. So at the end of the day, you know, the, the targets were met and there's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears put into that, but also some really good tools in terms of targeted messaging and you know, mass communications to ultimately get that success. We've been talking about delight and usability. How much have we, as a field, been thinking about for whom? Delightful and usable for whom? And how much have we failed at that? How much have we, what, I, I, you know, a hot topic of conversations for years. I mean, the first time Jen and I met years ago, that was a discussion we had, which is, okay, it's great that we're making apps for hipster nerds in Williamsburg <laughs> to get home, you know, from the bar, but how much are we really providing services, you know, to, to other Americans, to this, to the single father who's trying to figure out how to get his kids to school efficiently or things like that. Um, how do you think about, and when you think about usability, how do you make sure that you're not just thinking about people like yourself and the people you're in the room building these tools with? So the, there's a, a, a mini stern lecture that I give to, uh, to, to people who releasing open data, especially in uh, state agencies seem to do this, where they, they have uh, this field of dreams mentality. Like if you release it, if you release the data, they will come and they implicitly are uh, male geeks in their 20s. That, that's who the they <laughs> is. They will come and they'll make apps, and then everything will be wonderful. Uh, and it's not working. That's actually a terrible approach. <laughs> uh, and uh, it actually fits in well with the, the topic of the healthcare.gov, too, where, where you know, one of the lessons of that was that government should probably do 
for itself core things that are really important instead of outsourcing them. Uh, of course, healthcare.gov was uh, really important for the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, uh, not just in terms of PR, but also in actually getting people to be able to sign up. Uh, and outsourcing that went terribly. But then there was the lesser heralded success story of what happened after it went terribly when government brought in a couple of dozen brilliant people and stuck them in a, a hotel suite in Columbia, Maryland, and said, you're here till it's fixed. You do it however you want, but fix it. And, and they did uh, and continue to use this iterative development process to in, improve that site. And from that came 18F, which y'all will, will hear about later. Uh, so the, the process has been one of, oh, government, we just release data. That's, that's all we do. And then it's up to other people to do something with it. Uh, what we're starting to see is this, this move towards things like uh, API UX, you know, the, the user experience of your application programming interface, which is, you would never have heard those two terms side by <laughs> side until about a year ago. Like it's, there is no user experience behind data, right? No, wrong, there very much is. And I, I wouldn't have put those side by side until about a year ago either. There's a new concept for me. Uh, so as we move some of this functionality into government, as government uh, starts to respect its, its IT people as actually being important in how they interface with the public, I think we're going to see a lot of improvement on this front. Let me just, before you jump in, um, we're going to go to you guys soon and actually be participatory in a discussion about participatory <laughs> media in a, in a second. Did anyone else want to talk about the usability? Of the yeah, I would, I would say um, that is the most forgotten question in a lot of our endeavors is who are the users and what are they trying to accomplish? And I think healthcare.gov, if you stopped reading it in, st stopped reading the news stories in October, you'd have a very different perspective than if you followed it all the way through when the efforts of Jen, of Todd Park, and of the, the real crack team, the A team that they put together to fix it, that's how it's supposed to work. That's how technology works. And that's a foreign cultural concept to government that it ain't going to be right the first time. Um, but that is how technology works. And that's, I think, what we're all talking about in many ways. One other example I'd, lo I'd love to, to put on your radar screen there, too, is uh, the stimulus, the Recovery Act. I think that's one of the most unheralded stories of this entire thing. Um, when the recovery.gov started under uh, Earl Devaney, there, was a, there were a lot of problems, right? There were made up con congressional districts. The data was wrong. And he took a beating for it in front of a committee that I happened to used to work on. Uh, so I got to see him getting user feedback in the most public, painful way possible, but also being a steely enough leader and public servant to turn around and say, guys, when the next hearing happens in a month and a half, we're going to have this stuff fixed. And guess what they did? And that led all uh, to the successes of stopping fraud, stopping waste, improving services for taxpayers. They know what they got for their money. And at the end of the day, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, that's the most important thing about all of this. And it all came down to who is the users and what data they, are they trying to, uh, to get out to the public. And, and, you know, John, I think some of it is just asking users what they want. And at least in government, that hasn't always been done as a routine course of business. And it's amazing what you learn when you reach out to your users and ask them about their experience. We're in the process of developing a new content model for USA.gov, which is the, the portal to the government for the public. And for years, we've had these really slick rotator panels, like many websites, that our content folks thought were really cool. They had good images on them. They had interesting content on them. And we really thought that that was driving traffic to the website. And then when we looked at the analytics and looked at what users were really doing, we found those rotator panels were barely used at all and clearly were not important to our users. And so what we've done is totally changed it up, but we've also um, written up some articles about how to optimize, if you're going to use rotator panels, how to optimize them and, and talk a little bit about ex our experience. And we're sharing that with our colleagues across government so that others can benefit from what we've learned from our users. And then we're, we've also um, are launching something called the Government Customer Experience Index, where we're measuring feedback from the public on our public-facing sites and services. Because so often, um, if you don't ask the user, and us the user in our case is either an agency or the public, you don't know. So I think some of it is about not just identifying who the users are, but then asking them, what's your experience? You know, is yeah. it, did, were you able to complete your task? Would you refer this to a friend? Would you come back and use it again? How was your overall, how satisfied were you overall? 
So let's bring you guys in and ask you how satisfied you are with this discussion. And if you're not, you can <laughs> hack it and take it in a different direction. I'll ask you to raise your hand and their microphones. And because we are live streaming this, uh, if you can wait for the microphone to arrive and maybe say who you are and where you're from or why you're here. Hi, I'm Susan Lerner <clears throat> from Common Cause New York. Um, and we've had a number of different projects over the years. We're very active with reporting the stimulus uh, money stream here in New York, uh, working with uh, a broad coalition primarily of base building anti-poverty groups across the state. We've worked with um, the question of reporting for social service agency success. Um, one of the things that we found very challenging, and I'd like some assistance because it really resonated for me uh, in some of the comments, is that what we found is that the advocacy community was often very disappointed in terms of the data that was being tracked, which is often throughput data and not performance data. And we found ourselves in roundtables and in other discussions with the agencies that we're tracking, saying to them, we need some sort of a performance dashboard. We need to be working with you to develop some metrics that are actually performance oriented. And we hit a very strong wall, particularly in the social services community, because I think of the feeling of it's going to turn into a gotcha. I'm going to be hauled in front of some committee and criticized. And how can we create the kind of interactive dialogue yeah. that you are talking about where the advocacy community that really relies on this data is able to help the agencies and the IT people focus on more, you know, expanding analysis internally and tracking the right metrics without it being uh, he said, she said, we're going to get yeah. you, you're going to be embarrassed. So how do you build that kind of trust? Time. I think that's the most important ingredient is time and time together. Uh, one of the beautiful things about technology and our Madison tool is essentially speaking to this problem in a policy making sense, which is if you get people who have different incentives or different perspectives together over time, they eventually will stop yelling and then we'll be able to start finding common ground or common cause and work together. And we've done that with uh, one of your colleagues, Jennifer Bavondangle in Maryland. It's exactly learning from that lesson that you have to have a culture. You can't come in for a day, a hackathon on a weekend, a month, or a year to build trust in any relationship. And this is just a relationship. Um, so I think time is the most important element there. I know that's not a great, great answer because I can't give you more of it. Um, but patience and time over will, will make a difference. I also think this is why it's important to have uh, laws often that mandate the release of the original source information, the data. Because if you're relying on causing somebody inside government to feel like there's no risk to engaging with you in a new way or sharing information transparently with you about things that aren't working so you can help them to figure out how to make it work better, um, that's, a, that's a big mountain to climb. Whereas I think if the baseline is this data is out and I'm going to be subject to third party external objective analysis about it and critique about it regardless, then that's a, that baseline is much easier to engage in a conversation about how can we work together to make it better from. Even if that data is kind of wonky and it's a small subset of the constituency of your uh, government that's actually going to actually look at it and care about it, I think it's really important and foundational. Yeah, I, you know, I think that the point about making, making it clear that this isn't a fad, that it's here to stay, and that's something that when um, the administration issued the open data executive order last, uh, about a year ago, May, it made a huge difference because it made it clear that this is what we are doing by default. This is not just some little cool management trend that a bunch of technology geeks have dreamed up. This is the way the government is going to operate. And here's why it's beneficial both to the public and to the government themselves. So I think that the other part of that is finding the win-win equation that creates a value proposition that everybody can rally around, even those with, with pretty divergent points of view and interests. I'm going to, is, okay, great, there's one here. Then I'm going to pick on one of you. And I know exactly, I, yeah. I'm just thinking about the results from Tuesday, and I'm wondering, what do you think it takes to get the general population to care about this issue and to respect what the government is doing? And the Obama administration and a lot of other governments have done some really remarkable work. And it's just something most people don't know about. Even if they might be using the sites, it's something they might take for granted. 
as you know, this is what technology is in 2014, rather than you know going to a site had the administration not done this work and saying, wow, this is from the 1970s. I'm, Why doesn't I'm, anyone care? I'm about okay your, with them not career caring. Work. I'm totally like, like if I but go. If you go back to the culture shift, if the people don't care, then government won't care. Government does so many things that people don't know. I mean, I don't think most people know the GSA exists. <laughs> I think right? you're right. <laughs> and yet it's incredibly crucial, and it can't go anywhere. Because if the GSA went away, government would not be able to function within days. Um, so I want. I want a lot of this work to get to the point where it's so necessary to not just produce but consume that uh, data shared within government that it can't go away. Because if it could go away, then maybe it should at some point if this is not actually doing something that's very useful to government. So I, I really, I look forward to the point when uh, A, it is sustainable like that, and B, in 10 or 15 years when people still say to me, wait, so what is it you do for a living? I can still say like, it's a, it's a gov government tech thing, don't worry about it. Um, because most people shouldn't care that ultimately this is something that government should be doing that, uh, that benefits government and that benefits uh, people in, uh, not in government in ways that they know about, but only a small number of them. The rest of them, I just know that I asked Google Maps how to get here and it told me how to get here. I don't have to care that the shape files originally came from Tiger and then the traffic data comes from some sort of traffic counter. None of that matters. I just did the thing my phone tells me to do. And uh, the less that people know how that happens, the more successful I think it is. I understand that's not a great answer politically, but it's, it's what I hope for. I would, I, and I, would, I would build on that. That's exactly true. Uh, as Waldo says, this is a thing, right? This is how the world is working outside of government. So this is going to be a thing for government. But there are islands of excellence. Um, something we found with a group a coalition we've started called the Free Law Founders, David Moore is a member, is that across the country there are elected officials, appointed officials of power who are doing good stuff and technologies exist elsewhere to help them do their work better. It's creating that, that sort of cross-city, cross-state uh, community so that you can share best practices, actually share code to do those jobs better because the things have already been started elsewhere. Does it, just as, sorry, and then aside on that, as we see a generational, not a shift, but changes in terms of who are making those decisions, so thinking about the elections, where we were just yeah. talking about younger congressmen come, and women coming in, do you, is there a correlation between generation and being open to some of the things we're talking about among policymakers, or is that a false, is that a false correlation and we shouldn't bet on, you know, just because Kasim Reed is 42 or whatever he is, that he's going to get digital, which he admittedly he does not, he says sometimes. Right? <laughs> well, well, I am of the firm belief that everybody can be gotten eventually with enough time. Um, but generation changes do, have, do make things go faster. I think right down the, the street here, Ben Kalos, one of your new council members, is, is doing the, you know, yeoman's work carrying this. And it's not, he's a younger elected official it comes more naturally to him, yeah. but he's taken on that mantle of going to those who have been on the council for decades sometimes and building that trust, building that conversation, building that relationship so that as younger, more younger generation come, we don't have to fight the fight again. Yeah, although, I, you know, I have to say though, I think everybody, no matter what age you are, most people have the same expectations. People out in the world, no matter how old they are, expect that if they turn on their phone, assuming they have one, it will tell them easily how to get from point A to point B, and they expect that same seamless service from government. So I think one of the, one of the drivers of change is the rising citizen expectation that the experience they have in their private life should be mirrored when they, when they interact with government. And that's what we have to address. Vince? Yeah. Uh, Vince Philly, Medium Tech Funders. Um, I, I would just uh, echo what you're saying there. I think uh, anytime we think about the user, they always have more interest in the data than we expect. I mean, I think that you can see that, the uptake. Um, who pays for this? Uh, obviously, it's fantastic to hear the Knight Foundation announcement for the grant this morning. Um, there's probably no foundation that can make a grant to build healthcare.gov. Um, so what's the role of philanthropy, business, government in funding all this work? I think one of the things that we've seen is on a number of different fronts, government funding has been used to help leverage foundation or private sector funding in a very effective way. 
One of the things that uh, we're doing that I think is really exciting is launching a whole, we've uh, launched since the start of the administration, a whole new way of crowdsourcing solutions to pretty tough government problems through prizes and challenges. And one of the most effective ways of, of collaborating with both the philanthropy community and the private sector is by jointly sponsoring some of these big grand challenges around things like solar flares or energy efficient light bulbs or you know, all kinds of topics that are of uh, significant value to society but for which there's not an easily identifiable single force source of funding that will draw in the full stakeholder community. I, I just learned uh, yesterday that, that the roots of IBM lie in a census data, basically, apps competition, uh, where the, the Census Bureau had some thorny problems they couldn't figure out how to solve, and they said, basically, here's a contest. Who in the public can figure out how to solve this? The guy who solved that, how he went to solve it, founded what went on to become <laughs> IBM. I had no idea. That was really fascinating. Uh, I've been one of the people telling governments, like, oh, maybe less apps contests and hackathons uh, might be good. Uh, but now I'm revisiting that. And if you can get an IBM out of that, that's not so bad. So, Vince, one way, yeah. from the philanthropy perspective, one way we maybe are attacking that is we, I, we just are in the final stages of the night news challenge on libraries. And for us, libraries were exciting as a way to approach some of these open gov issues, some of these issues of how, does, how do these state institutions transform uh, by focusing on a particular sector. Right? And so the ideas that we've been wrestling with there relate to some of the issues that we've been talking here, but it's not this broad government you know, across the board, but rather looking at one particular mm -hmm. field in which government often overlaps and trying to, trying to help advance and transform that. Well, and I think the other role that you're playing is really, that's really important <laughs> is connecting levels of government because people out there in the world, they don't know or care. Is it local government? Is it state government? If it's federal government, it's monolithic government. And so by, you know, I think the, the funding and the, the role as a facilitator that these programs have played is in bringing together different stakeholders across level of, levels of government in a way that can have a very profound impact in a particular um, vertical area. I think an important, important way to maximize the leverage of the investments that are made, whether from public or private, is to make sure that when you do develop new technology or code that actually works in one place, you don't have to reinvent that wheel somewhere else or be dependent on a single vendor with proprietary IP to say, OK, we'll give it to this other place too. And that's why it's so great that code that's being developed out of GSA and 18F um, is open source by, by writ. You know, that is open source first. So if something works in one place, it can be propagated elsewhere, regardless of what level of government it is or even what country it is. We should be solving mm -hmm. problems together collaboratively and not letting IP get in the way. Just on Monday, I was about to start talking to a state agency had asked me for advice on opening up their data. And I, I was about to launch into my usual talk about the software they can use and so on. I said, well, so far, we've stood up an open data site uh, using uh, data.gov's WordPress and uh, CCAN code. And you can see it here. And we have 20 data sets on it. You don't need me. Clearly, yeah. I'm not necessary in this transaction <laughs> in any way. We have time, I think, for one more question, maybe hopefully two. Um, just a, I'm Art Chang. I'm uh, the uh, founder of Tipping Point Partners um, in New York, and we work at the intersection of government, education, and uh, software startups. And I'm also a member of the New York City Campaign Finance Board and chair of their Voter Assistance Advisory Committee. And um, we have, um, my question is just a very simple one, is, is open data enough? Is open gov enough? that we talk about the need for um, apps like, or the user experience of things like Google Maps. Well, there's a translation layer between the data and the person. And so what I'm not seeing and I'm not hearing, and I feel like one of the, one of the things that's missing is the ownership of that translation layer. Like, who is going to own that? Is that on the government side? Is it on the private sector side? Do foundations do this? Like, where does that sit? And who's actually going to catalyze that? And is the public by itself enough to understand what to do with the data and how to deploy it. Yes. What's the transla <laughs> translation layer? Uh, so to my mind, all, all the above is the answer. And that's the only way that it's really going to happen comprehensively. So GSA is doing great work in being that translation layer for certain types of data. Private entrepreneurial companies hopefully will do that. And they can if the, data, the underlying source data is available to them. So I think the answer is it's going to take all of us translating for different stakeholder communities around different uh, issue and service areas, and that's why opening up the data and having every stakeholder group that can do something about translating it, having direct access to it is really important and foundational. Even though you may not think that one piece of that is important to you, 
there may be another stakeholder audience that it is really yeah. important to. And I think it's not, I think the data itself isn't enough. There, there's a whole lot of, I mean, it's not just data, it's content too. So some of it is how do you make people even aware of what content and what data is out there? And I think that's a problem that all of us share. I mean, there's, there's much more interest in the public in what doesn't work than what does work. So how do you build trust in government and interest in and awareness of how government can more effectively serve citizens by helping them be aware of the role of government, the value of the data or the other content that we have, and how it can contribute to the problems that people are experiencing or the, people, the problems they're trying to solve. We have time for one more question in the back, if you can wait for the microphone to get to you. My name is Anna Levy. I'm from Social Impact Lab. We work with Inclusive Technologies. Um, I wanted to ask how the government's perception of the public changes when, when the term used is users uh, as opposed to citizens or residents. That's an excellent question that we struggle with all the time because um, it's very important to be inclusive. And, and obviously the public that we're serving are not all citizens. So I appreciate your comment and agree with you. I, I often fall back on just saying, although you can hear me go People. through it, I'll say, well, you know, how does this best serve users? Citizens, residents, <laughs> humans. People. How do people? People, uh, because all, every one of them is too restrictive for some use case. Um, and I've been guilty of years, I mean, for 20 years, of saying user or consumer. And this is entirely the wrong word because it leads to entirely the wrong mindset. So I've got one last question, which maybe relates to this. We've talked very little about capitalism and building businesses off this, these data. What is the, the next billion dollar business built off of a government data site is going to be what? Shows. I'm not going to tell you because I'm going to build it. <laughs> um, but I think that that gets at, in another way, the sustainability question. That if what we as a civic technology community are doing is so good, and Waldo has taught me this, at some point somebody's going to pay for it because somebody is paying for it done in a less efficient, closed, and more expensive way. Um, and with the help of the Knight Foundation, that's a lot of what we've been doing, taking the state Dakota that Waldo started in Virginia uh, into a place where it can go nationally easily to every city and every state in the country. Somebody's paying for promulgation of their laws and legal codes right now. We can do that for next to free and sometimes free. Um, well, that's a big sustainability point there. Waldo, you don't have a capitalist bone in your body, so you, I know not you true. have lots of ideas. So you're <laughs> I not started gonna... my first business instead of going to college. <laughs> um, so uh, I am really psyched about transportation data. I think the most undervalued data set or type of data out there is transportation data, mostly because it's held by these state and sometimes local level fiefdoms. And I don't mean just transit data, but transportation data. Um, as we move to smarter cars, that relies on really detailed, granular level data about roads and who has that data about those state agencies. Google doesn't have enough of the, nor will they anytime soon, the ability to get the granular level. Their self-driving cars only work on a tiny amount of roads that they have the really, really detailed data about. Um, this data is going to be really useful really soon, and I think transportation agencies are going to be the ones who, who uh, hold and release that data. Andrew, what's your billion dollar idea? So uh, I do have a company that helps governments with open source platforms. I don't think it's going to become a billion dollar business, but maybe I'm, I'm not thinking big enough. Um, one thing that I'm really interested in, though, is uh, very simply, actually the consumer, to use one of those uh, maybe inappropriate words for all of us uh, uh, you know, in, in the new context is, you know, we buy things from government, essentially. We renew our driver's licenses. We pay our taxes. We you know, get fishing and hunting licenses. And by and large, it's a horrendous experience. And that actually really matters to the bottom line of government. And when governments don't allow us to easily pay for things, as crass as that may sound, we end up having to pay more in taxes and in other ways, like standing in line at a DMV for hours on end or what have you. So I think that just by learning the way that the private sector is so phenomenally awesome at e-commerce today and applying that to government and bringing some of those tools that work well in the private sector into government, um, healthcare.gov perhaps being one, one good seminal example, of uh, and how not to do it and uh, maybe an opportunity to do it better. I think there are many billion dollar businesses therein. Yeah, and I, you know, if I, if I knew the answer to that question, I perhaps might not be sitting in this chair. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, I think it's really the convergence of the data rather than any single data set. So if you look at the convergence of big data with social, 
and with cloud and with mobile. It's that convergence that allows us to really harness the power of data we have in a lot of really cool areas. Healthcare, climate, I agree, transportation, sustainability. There's a whole universe of potential out there. And what we need is for people who um, have the capability to pull those things together and figure out, you know, as, as was done with the overused examples of GPS and, and weather, you know, I don't think it's any one single data set. I think it's combining it and then leveraging it through the use of social media cloud and, and big data trend analysis. That's where the billion dollar business is. And if any of you know where it is, you should let us know and we'll make sure that we get those data sets out. Yeah, and we have an, a venture fund, so we'll invest in that idea too. Um, thank you guys so much. This was really thank great, you. I think. And we learned, I learned a lot, so um, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.